this chapter has got lots and lots of detail. It is really where the, what they call product realization, uh, which we would normally consider manufacturing, uh, but it involves a lot of different aspects. And so we'll start to work our way, and then when our HR person returns, we will return to chapter six. Chapter six uh, is not that long, so we'll fix that once we back up. So what are some of the topics in seven? Determine the quality objectives. Now we've been talking about quality objectives, but we're talking about uh, corporate quality objectives. Now we're talking about the quality objectives, uh, or the quality requirements, the quality specifications for the product. What are they? That's on the product. That's on the model and all the other specifics. Your job, uh, normally done as part of the design process, which we'll dig into here in a bit, is to determine what those are. As you are doing that, one thing to be attentive to is um, when you're looking at specifications, is one-sided, two-sided, and or what, what exactly are the acceptance criteria. Frequently I see people not pay attention to that. They really have a two-sided spec, but they'll define it as one-sided or they don't have an acceptance criteria whatsoever. It makes it pretty hard then to determine whether or not the product meets specification. Pay attention to the little details like uh, significant figures. I did an audit one time uh, manufacturing facility. We're actually looking at calibration, but I was looking at the data and I forget what it was they were measuring. I looked at the data and all of it is to about the fourth or fifth decimal place, and the data is all exactly to the fifth decimal place identical. Is that a problem? Gee, they're good. No, there's no way that in reality that would ever happen. So, one of two things. They're either making the data up, which is a really big problem, or they don't understand what they're supposed to be doing. It was the latter. They're measuring, this was a dimensional measurement. They were doing it <clears throat> to four decimal places, as I recall, and doing it with a steel ruler. So, really? <laughs> no, you're not. Not to four decimal places. Uh, and, and no tolerance at all. What's your as what? An inch? Five centimeters? Who knows? Not defined. So as you are looking at these uh, specific quality parameters, these quality objectives, uh, consider those type of things. Is this a two-sided spec? Is it a one-sided spec? Uh, if so, what are the tolerances around it? Frequently, if we're looking at drawings, those are all called out on the drawing anyway. Uh, but you want to check that because your auditors are. All right, so determine the product requirements. The product specifications, product requirements are similar. The requirements lead to the specifications. You will do this as part of design, and we'll dig back into this in a bit. Uh, how is the thing supposed to function? So, uh, one thing that I am seeing, and I'll point out, from the notified body auditors in particular, they are paying a lot of attention to other European standards that may apply, such as robots. We organized that in last week. I think that he asked like six questions on robots. I was like, I've never seen it get into this kind of depth on this uh, material before. But that apparently has become one of the things they're paying particular attention to. So in terms of product requirements, specifications, where those specifications involve meeting some external standard, like Rojas or One Triple E or whatever they might be, make sure you spell them out. Uh, make sure that you have documentation that shows that they're met. Uh, resources including uh, infrastructure and work environment. This is a problem for a lot of companies that don't have specific work environment requirements. I suspect perhaps like you since you're not manufacturing here, right? So you don't have Control, uh, control space, you don't have clean rooms, you don't have this, that, and the other. Uh, what's your procedure say? Do you have a procedure? You should. You should have a procedure that 
basically defines this by what you don't have, such as you know, uh, the facility is the language I typically use uh, says the facility is maintained for uh, employee comfort. This is one place where you don't want to be too specific. But some kind of general disclaimer, if in a situation like yours, you have no product requirements, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But you do want somewhere, procedure is nice, you could put this in the quality manual, uh, so long as you know where it is, so when the auditor asks for it, you can point to it. Said, you know, our facility is maintained for uh, employee comfort. We have no specific environmental requirements such as temperature, humidity, what have you, what have you. Specify that. It takes that, it takes that whole line of questioning off the table. If you don't, it's kind of like listing the exclusions. If you don't list that, we don't know. So we're going to start asking 5,000 questions. Uh, and you know, want to know all kinds of detail, we can bypass the whole thing. Let's move on to stuff that is relevant, not worry about the stuff that is not. Um, be careful in this document, anything where you define, and I know you guys were talking about warehousing, uh, take, this is a particular concern there. Uh, anytime you define an environmental requirement, particularly temperature, you say maintain temperature between you know, 70 and 85. What do I expect? That documents the records. Now, if you just put that together, say, eh, 70 and 85, you know, that'd better be comfortable at that range. Not half of this will freeze, the other half will be odd. But, but if you put a range like that, my expectation is an auditor, as well as a notified body, as well as the FDA, uh, Thinks that you put that range in there for some specific reason, and that reason is tied to product quality. We're going to ask you about it, and we're going to ask for records. How do you monitor this? And you know, what are you talking about? I'm going to find out the temperature. It's you know, 70, 85, good enough. No, I want to see records. So be careful how you specify this. Now, if you do have particularly in you know, offsite warehouses or contract manufacturing, where they do have real environmental requirements, they need a uh, process equipment in place to be able to do that. And that, lots of questions that you'll be asking as an auditor if you're looking at those. How are you doing it? The state of the art, and the way most uh, facilities that have been constructed recently, uh, use sensors that are mounted in the ceiling. They're all tied to some central uh, computer, tracks trends, spits out lovely graphs, um, <clears throat> has alarms built in. The old way of doing this is with the wind-up chart recorder, which works, it's compliant, but it requires that somebody maintain it, somebody goes out there and changes those charts every day. That does not happen, it can testify. Uh, lots of audits where uh, Gee, the chart's been around 42 times now because nobody's bothered to change it in the last six months. That's particularly disturbing when you see it on sterilization. But uh, do pay attention to that. So um, make sure that the documentation states that there is no requirement when, in fact, that is the case. Don't get yourself held accountable to this huge amount of information when none of it applies. Uh, sentences like, you know, we maintain the facility for employee comfort. Good enough. You haven't given me a range. I'm not, there's no data I'm going to ask for. I'm not going to go around, are you comfortable? You know, I'm not going to go around and uh, do that type of thing. Uh, they get you out from under all of this. Where there are, be particularly attentive to that. Those things are frequently not well controlled. Um, validation. If they have such a system installed, that system has to be validated. Um, <clears throat> some products, you know, I've got a number of them that are recombinant uh, proteins used to augment uh, in, uh, uh, various orthopedic applications, augment bone growth, bone fillers. Uh, those things have very tight requirements, and the monitoring around them is substantial, even including the shipping, uh, which is a whole other topic. Infrastructure work requirement is whatever you need. So if you don't really have any requirement, fine and dandy. As quality auditors, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow, 
but from the quality perspective, the FDA, ISO, internal auditors, we don't care about OSHA. We are not going to inspect the landscape. Now, if you, as an internal auditor, if that's in your scope, we are a guest. But your regulatory folks do not audit to any of that. The FDA could care less. They're not even going to bring up the topic. You may have all kinds of, hopefully you do, all kinds of safety requirements, but your uh, regulatory people are not going to audit against it. OSHA comes in, and that's a different deal. But uh, the FDAs, there is no crossover. They don't talk to one another. Uh, let's see, what else do we have to talk about? We're going to talk about process validation here in a bit. That is a very big deal. Fortunately, unlikely that it applies to you, and for that, you can be grateful. Uh, required inspection testing, this is all on the manufacturing side of things. All of that should be defined in whatever they call the assembly record. Uh, people call it lots of different things. Whatever they call it, that's where all that level of information is detailed. Uh, records that are maintained, also part of that batch record for lack. I like that term, it kind of handles all of it. Documented risk management to uh, the standard, and there's a specific element now in 13485 that requires you to reference the risk management standard, which is 14971, which we'll talk uh, a lot more about here shortly. Realize there are two versions of that standard. If you manufacture for distribution in the United States and Europe, both of them apply. One does not supersede the other. They both apply, and we go into detail on that in a bit. Industrial related process, we already talked about this in terms of this is how you document, particularly in your case where you are more or less custom building this equipment for a given customer, the interface between you and the customer. How is that managed? Documents, records. How do you know they're getting what they uh, ordered? Requirements for delivery, post delivery. Not too many uh, post delivery things very often, but how does the customer want this delivered? How do you ship it? Uh, any statutory regulatory requirements? That's kind of built into, we don't have to reference them specific, that's built into the process. Uh, training for safe use of the device. I'm going to defer that until we talk about risk, because there's a number of things. The standard approach to that is what? The user manual. No. Do not take this piece of electrical equipment into the shower. You know, lots of things like that. So, any additional requirements you may have. Because those are typically found in the user manual, instructions for use, and uh, what have you. <coughs> uh, organization <coughs> shall review the requirements for the product. This is an ISO focus. Completed prior to supply. That means prior to my shipping it out the back door. Again, this is what I alluded to a couple of times where this is what the customer ordered. This is how I know that this is what we are shipping to them. And yes, they match. Now, fine, somebody looks at that. So what? As a document. Look at your shipping and delivery documentation. There ought to be a checkbox in there, particularly in your case, because you have more or less custom-made products. There should be a checkbox in there that said, I, whoever does it, um, could review the customer order against the shipping information, <coughs> shipping manifest, uh, whatever it may be, and uh, have determined that we're providing what the customer ordered, or whatever language you want to use to that effect, sign date. So now you have good documentation that the customer's requirements are being met, right? You are probably doing that anyway. Otherwise, you're going to get a bunch of customer complaints. The question is, are you documenting? What's your objective evidence of compliance? If you're doing it, great. If you're not, probably don't think about it. Um, there's a lot of discussion in some of these procedures. A lot of it gets into non-conforming product about acceptance by uh, concession and so forth. We can touch on that later. That's basically if we know that for some reason the product is non-conforming, we have a discussion with the customer. The customer says, fine, I'll take it anyway. 
It's called acceptance by concession, and that uh, if that is the case, it needs to be carefully documented. Because you've got documentation that says the product doesn't meet the specification. You ship it anyway. What's that look like? Doesn't look good. There might be a good reason for it. So if that is the case, make sure that you document that well. Uh, maintain the records, review this process. Uh, changes reviewed, amended, communicated to the user, to the end, to the customer. We change um, specifications, and uh, this doesn't mean you have to send every customer a letter necessarily. Change the specification on some product, that specification goes to the customer, that's what they order, and things as it should be, and pretty much business normal. They order something, there's a change in the middle of the process prior to delivering them their product, that change needs to be specifically communicated to them because you're providing them something different than what they originally ordered. Good business, like I said. All right, customer communication we just touched on. Product information, inquiries, order handling. You have processes for this, or you wouldn't still be in business. Customer feedback, we will talk separately about. It's a critical, uh, critical process. That's uh, number one. Number one and number two of FDA's warning letter topics are the complaint system and CAPA. And they trade places year to year, but it's always those two things. The complaint system is critically important. Uh, FDA spends a lot of time on it. It will get you a warning letter if it's not done correctly. I have a customer in uh, Florida somewhere. Warning letter on their complaint system that is in their process, they, uh, in their document, they actually said, if we can't reproduce the complaint, it's not a complaint. FDA took a good view of that. Warning letter. All right, uh, communicate with regulatory authorities. You have processes for this. Uh, medical device reporting, MDRs, the Canadian version, the European version advisory notices. We'll touch on those uh, a little bit later. But uh, depending on the markets you're in, the take on this is depending on the market you are in, there are specific processes that uh, you can go through. A complaint in Canada that would reach government level is handled differently than a complaint in the U.S., differently from a complaint in the EU. There are separate processes different people have to be notified, the time frames are different. Uh, we have that baked into these procedures, including the websites, uh, to go visit for Health Canada and what have you. Um, so make sure that your procedures, and when you're auditing this, that's one thing that we look at, to make sure the procedures uh, match the geographic markets you're in. Um, that's, this is one of the, remember I said there's some Canadian-specific procedures, this is one of them. How do we uh, talk to Health Canada should the need arise? All right, well, one of the big hitters in Chapter 7 is design and development. Design and development is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least seven critical elements to it. These are standard, they're across the board, they're both in the QSR and in 1345. Design and development is a very structured process, and it doesn't matter what you are designing and developing, it follows the same process. Depending on the product, some things might get more emphasis. Product has software in it, which I'm sure yours does. It has uh, at least firmware. Um, FDA considers firmware indistinguishable from software. That adds a level of complexity. There's an ISO standard on that, as you would expect. Um, so you need a procedure that describes the, uh, not recommended, but required process that one goes through and how you document it. That's uh, design and development stages, which we'll enumerate in a second. Design review is a required element. We'll talk about how you manage that in a second. Verification, validation, we'll touch on, touch upon the difference between the two. Responsibilities, authorities, who does what, manage these interfaces, 
And uh, how is all this documented? It ends up at the end of the day in your design history file. Yet another acronym for you to keep track of. DHF, design history file. This is where the design and development documentation ends up. It is a requirement for products which you design. Uh, you will be asked an audit for the DHF. So how would you try the suite of documents that comprise the DHF? DHF is not one document, it's a compilation of a lot of documents. And those documents are seen here. The first bullet uh, that's not there that should be there is design plan. This is a requirement. It's also really good business. My uh, MBA is in project management, so this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Uh, if you do not document a design plan, uh, then who knows what you're going to end up with, will it be successful or not. We spend huge amounts of time, effort, and money on these development products. If you don't do it efficiently and effectively, you're throwing a lot of money away. So design plan. Somebody who has a good working knowledge of project management would be a very good uh, resource here. What's that thing supposed to look at? The, the regulatory requirements around this are not very specific. You can do this any way you want. At a bare minimum, from a good business perspective and a regulatory perspective, you need to carefully define what, what does success look like? What am I doing here? Now these projects can be very large and develop some brand new type of product or very small in scope. You know, take our existing product and make some small improvement to it. Both are design projects. Both need to be defined. What is it at the end of this project? What is it we're trying to accomplish? How can we determine whether or not we were successful? There's a lot of criteria that go into that for you to determine, but you need to define this. The design plan, depending on how you would have this documented in your procedure, it can include a lot of different documentation, schedule, budget, you know, however you've elected to do that. But scope is the only part of that that I recommend that you put under change control. You don't want to put the schedule under change control. It changes constantly. Probably don't want to put the budget under change control because it changes as people come and go for any number of other reasons. The scope, however, this is, this is my, this is opinion, this is advice. The scope, one, you want that approved by upper management because they're putting the bill for it. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want this product to look like. These are the requirements I want you to meet. If that changes over the course of the uh, project and you don't document it, at the end of the project, what happens if you're the project manager? You just did something that is different than what's done in writing. This is what causes project managers their jobs frequently. So, uh, word to the wise, if you're the project manager on anything, make sure you get the scope in writing, get it approved, and when management comes to you and says, I want you to do something different, say, we'd be delighted to do that. Here's the change control and change the scope of my project so that I'm being held accountable for what you have told me you want now, not what you told me originally. Failure to do that will make your career as a project manager very short and unpleasant. Trust me. <laughs> Good manner. Um, so that's project plan. These elements that are on this slide are in the regulation itself. This is not an abstract of how to do it. This is actually, every one of these things is, in, is defined in the regulation, both sides, uh, FDA and ISAC. Design inputs. What's this uh, product supposed to do, and how is it supposed to do it? This is real basic to the design. What's it, how's it supposed to function? It's supposed to lift 650 pounds, not 400 pounds. Um, how's this, you know, using this, that, the other. Um, 
inputs are, uh, the best way to do this in my opinion is to use a matrix. Because what you're required to do is uh, track inputs against the, the corresponding outputs. Regulation talks about them uh, they're not being conflicting. For example, I wouldn't want an input that says, uh, one input that says that you know, the lift needs to be capable of 600 pounds and a different input that says it needs to be capable of 800 pounds. Now my inputs are in conflict with one another. I need to resolve that. What, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? Let's compromise, make it 700, whatever. So inputs are what I'm trying to accomplish, outputs are what I am accomplishing, and how. So they're typically done in a matrix. Here's what we, you know, here's the design uh, parameter, here's how it is met. The output for many of these things will be a test report. The input, for example, if we're building, uh, let's say, some new power lift out here. One of the inputs is that it has to pass electrical safety. 60601-1, edition 3.1 to be precise. What's the output? The test report from whomever you hired to do it for that testing. So the, there's your input, must meet the electrical safety standard. My output is the test report that concludes, we hope, that it met the standard. Same thing with EMC and any number of other uh, similar things that might be inputs. Uh, biocompatibility, if it applies, uh, 10993s, uh, dash five, cytotoxicity, dash 10, sensitivity and er erotization. For any of the beds that people stay in any period of time, those are probably requirements, I would imagine. So your inputs are, it meets the standard, your output is the test report. For other things, uh, the input, could say, you know, here are the dimensions. What would the output be? The drawing. And then later the actual uh, measurements that show that it meets the drawing. So, inputs, outputs. If you submit, and I know you said you're class one, so you're not submitting this stuff to FDA, but uh, first class two device that you do, where you have to submit a 510K. Two, again, right now we're two exempt. Got some class two, but they're exempt. Okay, so the first one you do that's not exempt, this has to be submitted to the agency. <clears throat> they read this stuff and they read it in considerable detail. So uh, if you do not have this input output matrix uh, <clears throat> done and done well, you're going to get it kicked back to you with lots and lots of questions, which slows down the whole process a lot. So better to build it in up front, get it all done, uh, make sure these things match. Make sure you don't have any inputs that don't have corresponding outputs. That means, oops, we forgot, we forgot to do the electrical safety testing. Minor detail. Uh, you should not have any outputs that don't have corresponding inputs. These things need to match one another. What do you think about um, outcome, business outcomes as it relates to outputs? I know in the past it kind of helped me a lot to try to understand because it sometimes can get confused inputs and outputs. So looking at the outcome, what is it that you're really trying to achieve? Give me an example of an outcome that would not be an output. It's me what we say. I don't think so. Outcome, I mean, you can have business outcomes that would be uh, separate from this process. Let's say that I've desire the business outcome that I'm going to sell 25,000 of these things in the first year. It's not part of the design and development process. That is that is a desirable outcome. You would never list that as an input. That's way downstream. Okay. Is that helping? Yes. Okay. So yeah, there are things that are desirable. If I'm going to spend all this time and effort developing this product, I'd really like to sell it. And the sales uh, people are going to probably have some profit to hit. You might have profitability targets, you know, all kinds of targets. Uh, there are lots of downstream performance measures. How long does it take to build one of these? You no doubt have some productivity uh, measures. This is not where they belong. Those aren't good things to measure, they're important, they're not part of the design because it's, it's way downstream. 
and you only have to get fat. These are, you know, how do we build the product so that it meets our intended use uh, and whatever regulatory requirements there may be. Uh, and this is where you are uh, looking at things over, above and beyond uh, just ISO and just FDA. Depending on the products you make, there are OSHA requirements. There are uh, you know, any number of other specific requirements. Uh, you know, uh, ADA compatible or any number of things that you also take in. Those are inputs. What's the output? The output is the design that shows that it meets yet. This all gets around. That's why project managers make big bucks. Because uh, they have to manage all this. Design review. Mandated. It's a requirement. It's not just a nice to have, it's a requirement. Design now. The question is how many and when? Your call depends on the project. For short duration projects, you know, you're going to knock this thing out in two weeks. Probably do one. For a development project, you're going to come up with some new products. It's going to take you six, nine months uh, in development. You're going to have uh, certainly more than one. When you have them is up to you. And like I said, it depends on the nature of the project. My recommendation is do not put that in a procedure. Procedure is a blanket. It covers all of the development activities, short-term, long-term, medium-term. Put this requirement in your design plan. That thing is written for a specific design activity. So hey, for this, if all I'm gonna do is update the firmware from Rev 1.1 to Rev 1.2, I'm going to take care of that probably pretty quickly. So I may only need one design review. I'm going to build you know, a brand new lift or a brand new bed. That's going to take me nine months. I'm going to have a number of them. In most cases, you want to hold your, at a minimum, you want to hold the design review after inputs. Why? Why is that so important? If inputs are not right, if inputs are not correct, what's the rest of the project going to look like? <coughs> Train wreck. <laughs> you can spend a lot of time and effort chasing down the wrong path. So it's a really good idea. It's not a regulatory requirement, but it's just good business sense. Really good idea to hold a formal documented design review after the inputs are defined. Another very good time to do it is after the output certified. Make sure that matrix is all done. So, um, if you read the regulation, both sides, a design review uh, is usually with the project team, but it needs to include someone who is not specifically accountable for the work that you're reviewing. You want somebody with some independence uh, so if you only have the three engineers who did the work on the design review, it would be in violation of that. Uh, QA is a great choice. Uh, they're not responsible for any of the hands-on engineering, you hope. Uh, but they're always a great choice to be that additional pair of eyes. You know, somebody who's not got a uh, dog in that fight uh, is a great person, to have, and is required, actually, uh, to be part of the design review. All right, that brings us to verification and validation. These sound like similar activities. Get in the engineers. What's the difference? From the, reg <laughs> From the regulatory perspective, they are different. And not, not always, all, both of them are not always required. Of the two, validation is the more important. The difference between them is verification can be done during the development process itself, and, they, and verification can be done on specific modules while the rest of the product is being developed, uh, and, it can, and it can be a bench test. Now that doesn't mean that you can do verification testing on something, and then down the road change that and not repeat it. That's, it's not a corollary. Uh, you want to do the verification uh, on the product that you're going to end up with, but it can be done earlier in the process. Validation, on the other hand, is the product as you intend to market it. 
doesn't necessarily have to be rolling off the commercial production line, but it does have to be identical to what you are going to actually ship out the back door. So you can't do validation on an early prototype, make uh, a number of changes and not be validated. Does that make sense? The, the distinction between these two was uh, problematic for a lot of folks. We, we've always used it as verification that did you build the product right? Right. In other words, testing, measurements, and validations. Did you build the right product? Exactly. So right. Does anybody want it? Is it meeting customer needs? Is it meeting specifications? Does it exactly does it right? Does it meet all of the specifications I have described for it? Exactly right. All right, design transfer. This is for the tail end of the process, and this is throwing the uh, product over the wall from the design and development environment into production. Now, <coughs> ISO uh, 1345 2016 didn't, this has always been a requirement, but it was largely ignored, <laughs> truthfully, uh, didn't get much emphasis. Process risk is now a requirement, uh, and it should be done at design transfer. So I'm going to spend more time on risk management in a minute, but there, no, there's more than two, but for our purposes right now, there's two elements uh, to risk assessment. One is for the product itself. What could possibly go wrong with this? Any number of you know, possibilities there. That's the product. The second element, which is now formally in the standard, is process. Of the two, process is way easier. I'll elaborate on this in a bit. The process risk is in my manufacturing process, either here or there, regardless, uh, what can go wrong that uh, could pose a risk downstream. Process risk is much easier. But design transfer is the time where uh, we should start thinking about that. I'm going to throw this over the wall into the production environment, wherever it may be. Has process risk been done, or is somebody in the process of doing it? Important question, because the, uh, particularly the ISO folks are going to start asking for it. FDA is also starting to ask for it, but uh, where I have seen them ask for it has not been in inspections, but in uh, applications, which you know, you're exempt, so you wouldn't see that. But they are paying attention to this, and actually start to ask lots of very detailed questions. But in our design process, this is the time where that's going to uh, something we need to pay attention to. All right, control the design change. Now we already talked about this, didn't we? Is there can you can you think of anything in design that would not be covered by your document change control procedure? How do we make the product is defined in a, in a process procedure? Specifications for the product are all defined in a document, labeling, every, everything imaginable. Uh, if you come up with something that is not covered by a document, you have probably uncovered a liability that you need to fix. Uh, because virtually every aspect of the product should be covered by some other document. You already have a document change control procedure and process. So control of design change done. Point to your document change control procedure and use it. Plain and simple. All of these activities obviously generate records. Those records are compiled into the design history file by product or product family. If you have, and particularly in your case, you know, when you've got different nuances of the same product. You don't have to have a DHF for every single iteration of this thing. You would do that by design family. You know, uh, patient left, you know, one, two, three, four, or models, one, two, three, four, five. Same way you would do your type file. So, so you've got some flexibility on, on how you arrange this, but must have the documentation. In a, uh, this gets a little complicated, so I'm not going to go into it too deeply. In a 13485 audit, remember we said 13485 is foundational, it can be one product, it can be a bunch of products. Um, they 
are going to look at this, but they're looking at it for evidence that you comply with these requirements. It's not looking at it to approve the product. They're probably going to look at it again, actually. Uh, but they're looking, they will pick one, sometimes more than one, but they'll pick a, a design file to use for objective evidence that you're in compliance with these requirements. So it's not that they're uh, evaluating the product per se, they're using the product as an example of following this procedure. Make sense? Okay, enough on that. This is an area that, for well, many of the audits I do, is problematic. Uh, a lot of times they'll not do a plan, which is always puzzling. Um, the other one I frequently write non conformances for is uh, either they have not defined when they should do the review or they don't do it at all. The translation to production is frequently poorly done. Now that we are asking for formal process risk management, I'm getting a blank stare frequently. They have no idea what that's about. This, by the way, includes validation of any automated uh, process. You're doing 3D printing? Well. Um, and many other things which I'll touch on in a bit. Many of those processes require formal validation. All right. Some of these we'll come back to under other topics. Purchasing. I already talked about this from the purchasing aspect itself, real basic. Uh, purchasing, purchasing and vendor qualification and management are somewhat squeezed together. The purchasing aspect of it, straight, simple, easy to do. Make sure that you specify what it is you want to buy and make sure you have that disclaimer that we talked about. No, you can't substitute anything. But one real, real quick example of that, I have a good friend, a consultant, who works out of Southern California, and he works with a Malaysian company that makes all kinds of electrical cables that are used in tons and tons of different devices. So, president of the Malaysian cable company is over in Southern California doing a presentation to one of the mega huge medical device companies that are located there, hoping to get them to buy you know, several million dollars worth of their electrical cables. So he's up in front of the purchasing people and engineers and a whole room full of folks, saying our cables are wonderful, the thing separates in his hands. Oops. So after he gets home and tries to figure out uh, what actually happened, he found out that his wife had changed the purchase order for the adhesive because the one they're buying is just too expensive and this other one is a whole lot cheaper. Well, it's a whole lot cheaper because it's not compatible with the materials in their cable, thus it separates in his hands. So, great example of how what you might think is a relatively innocent change uh, can come and bite you in the rear end severely. And as I said, there have been a couple of these changes that put people in prison because it's ended up killing people. So this, make sure I get what I order, really is important. It seems like it's very straightforward and simple. The ramifications of not getting it done can be very bad. Now, uh, verification of purchase product is something we'll touch on later. That's independent inspection. Probably doesn't have direct application either. Uh, but we'll touch on that in a minute. Oh, it does. Sorry? It does. Oh, it does? Okay, well, good. Um, so, the big hitter is man how do you manage your suppliers? And your suppliers uh, are everybody from your raw material component, then, uh, suppliers to your contract manufacturers. The focus on this from the notified body is intense. As I said, this is why there's only half of them left, uh, because they did a very bad job of this. This is what killed people in Europe with the pressing thing. Substitution of the one silicone for another. Notified body was inspecting it and said, oh, it's all fine. Didn't, didn't bother to really dig in. How are you managing these? Oh, you say you're auditing? Okay. Did they bother to look in the audit report? No. So, uh, 
that's why this is such a focus now. Uh, like all things regulatory, uh, we react when terrible things happen. So this is why this is getting such scrutiny right now. What they are looking for in FDA 2 to a little bit lesser extent is active management of your various providers, suppliers, contract manufacturers, contract labs, uh, sterilization by implied view, uh, sterilizers if it did, um, actively managing these people. So how do you do that? Put together a procedure that talks about how do I initially qualify these folks? What are my requirements? Obviously, I have different requirements for different type of things I'm buying. Well, many of them provide me what I ordered. I'm a happy camper if you do. I want screws and nuts and bolts. Am I going to do a lot of uh, uh, requirements around that? Probably not. If you send me the screws and nuts and bolts that I specify, I'm likely to be happy. If you're in contract manufacturers, it's a different animal. And they spend a lot more time on that. So how do you qualify these people? Do they have to be ISO certified? No. Um, ISO certification for a contract manufacturer gives you an additional level of confidence. Uh, it is not a get out of free, get out of jail free card. It doesn't mean that you don't have to do anything. Uh, it gives you a little bit more confidence than somebody who does not have it. You at least know they've got in and they maintain their certification, you at least know they have a capable quality management system. You don't necessarily know what they do with your product. Um, are you required to do an on-site audit? Yeah, depending on the type. No. Oh, for us, we have. Depending on what you said. If your procedure says we're gonna audit our critical uh, suppliers every two years, every three years, every year, then you've created that for yourself. An on-site audit is the gold standard. It is the best thing you can do to make sure that the people that are doing things on your behalf are doing them appropriately. It's expensive, it's time consuming, you need to have a trained auditor to do it, which we'll talk a lot more about tomorrow. Um, there's lots of requirements there. It's, it's not cheap and easy. Uh, it is, by itself, it is not an ironclad requirement. It is the best way, particularly with contract manufacturers where the risk is really high, uh, it's the best way to know what's going on. Um, so make, uh, what the new standard requires you to do now, and this is brand new to 2016, is to classify your suppliers uh, from a risk perspective. How you do it's up to you. You want one, uh, you want two classes, you want three, it makes no difference. I would suggest no more than three. Critical, not, uh, it's not critical or in a minor, however you want to do it, or critical or non-critical, depending on what you're getting. Contract manufacturers, always critical. Other things, judgment call. How important is this component, this piece, and this is all from a risk perspective. If I'm buying a PLC board that controls how the unit operates, very important. This also applies to service providers. How about your notified body? These guys are fairly important. They determine whether or not you're on the market in the EU, Canada, Australia, lots of other places. It's critical. Now you're going to go audit them? Probably not. But so um, where you position these is up to you. There is no one right way. Uh, with the exception of all contract manufacturers should be considered critical. If, if you were to have a contract manufacturer manufacturing the product and say they're not critical, I'm going to look at you fine. Uh, that makes no sense. But other than that, it's up to you. It's, it's your call based on your product. You know, it's a risk assessment. But service providers should be in there too. So, you see that initial qualification. What, what do we require? Well, we, we require that you uh, provide us with what we need you to provide us for, as defined by the purchase order, drawings, whatever it may be. We, for some folks, we may require that you be ISO certified. Maybe 9001, 
not wild about it, but it will be okay. Maybe 13485. Uh, we may require an on-site qualification visit. We also track and trend non-conforming products that you send to us. You send us very many non-conforming products, then we're going to take action. That is right out of the regulation. So once we qualify and generate a document that says ABC Medical Supply is qualified to do the following signed date, there's my objective evidence of compliance. That yes, we qualified them and now they are qualified. Now I can go forward. Um, there's something that's going to be no problem on it. They'll come back to me. Now, once qualified, I'm not done. I have to monitor these people at the time, and this depends on what your procedure says. So, for non criticals, Basically, your monitoring of a non-critical supplier involves the quality history of the things that you're getting from them. If they meet spec, they're passing coming inspection, by and large, you're good. For your critical suppliers, up to you to define what does that mean. Do you audit every year? Do you audit every two years? Do you not audit at all? You can build in a system where if they're ISO certified, I don't need to go audit them except maybe infrequently, two, three, four years perhaps, because somebody else is. Um, as I mentioned, the fact that they're ISO certified does not necessarily mean that your product is in great shape. You can infer that, but you don't know for a fact. Because ISO certification might not ever look at your stuff. But they manufacture 25 different uh, materials, your stuff will never get looked at in an audit. So just because they're ISO certified doesn't necessarily mean that you would never visit them. That makes sense? Okay, um, so my routine reevaluation of these suppliers, depending on risk, this is a risk-based decision. What are we going to do? And give careful thought to this because we'll have to put in writing it would be helpful. You should be you know, obviously evaluating uh, stuff as it comes in anyway. If they fail to provide uh, inspect material or meet any other requirements you have set for them, make sure that your procedure has a provision to disqualify them. If they fail to meet your acceptance criteria, what happens? Well, you might put them on probation, that'd be okay, but you need in your procedure to state that the failure to meet uh, you know, uh, or agree upon quality standards can, issue, uh, can result in disqualification. That needs to be in the procedure. It's an audit form. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to touch on? Ah, the approved member list. Need one. Doesn't have to be hard copy, you can do it any way you want, but the approved vendor list is tracked by vendor and material. Let's say you approve, who's one of your big vendors? Lenac. Who? Lenac. Lenac? Lenac. Lenac. So you approve Lenac for a particular thing, or things. You don't approve these guys for anything and everything they make. So vendor approval is Vendor and product specific. Now, if you're buying a great many things from one person, that's fine. You don't have to do separate vendor approvals. But in that document, you just make a list of, uh, or a description of what it is they provide. So you don't, you don't approve company ABC or anything and everything, because that's not what you've evaluated. So you know, you're approved for this, that, and the other. So it is somewhat specific. And this is in your description. You don't have to list everything. You buy 500 things, you don't have to list them. Just describe it somewhat generically. The proof vendor list is an important tool for you. So, uh, describe the vendor, vendor name. If you number them fine, whatever. person likes to do that, that's, that's fine. What are they approved for? Any other information you want to put in there that's useful for you. One thing I would recommend is, depending on what your procedure says, last evaluation date, and this is a real date, this is how to keep yourself from getting a non-conformance. 
the, the actual date when you did the last evaluation. Now the last evaluation could be an audit, it could be a review of their incoming inspection for the last year, that's both of them are fine, both of them are the last evaluation. That's a real date. Next column, next evaluation due. So whatever your procedure says, let's just say for the sake of argument, it says we evaluate these guys annually. So last done, what are we, August 22nd, 2016. When's the next one due? What do you put on the, what do you put on the schedule? <coughs> you don't put August 22nd, 2017. Why not? Because it won't happen on August 22nd. So last time, August 22nd, next due, August 2017, or 2018, whatever it is. So uh, don't let, a lot of folks do this on Excel. Don't let Excel calculate this for you. Tell Excel to give me one year from the last date. It'll give you August 22nd. When you do it on the 23rd, just to be obnoxious, I'm gonna write you non performance. So it's meaningless, you just created it for yourself. So just be aware of that. I see that done a lot, that's why I bring it up. That for all supply or this critical? I'm sorry? That for all supply? Yeah. Those, you said uh, evaluations required for all suppliers. Only some suppliers that you determine might get an audit. All suppliers are evaluated. If it's only to say, yeah, we bought uh, five orders from them last year and they were all accepted, I'm done. <coughs> all I have to do. That makes sense? Not clear? It's, but as to what we define it. To what you define it. There are no, um, can you I'll backtrack? There is an expectation anymore that you or someone on your behalf audits your contract manufacturers. Can you just specify annually and be done with it? Yeah. Just got to do it. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't matter if you do it in August or May. Well, okay, that's problematic though. What does what, annual mean? What's annual mean, exactly. So if you did it in May of last year and October, the following October, are you good or not? I would, least, you can say calendar year. Uh, anytime calendar in the calendar, calendar, year, calendar year, but now you're up to uh, a whole lot longer than a 12 month period. I would be more sure. specific. Um, the better way, in my about, opinion. What about the quarter? And that would be fine. Uh, I did, you just don't want to. Lock, I don't even want to lock down by the month because there's things that happen that push yeah, out the month. That's fine. That's a good point. Um, also, something we would touch on in training. There's several other places where that applies. Don't uh, tie yourself in too specifically where that does not make sense. Allow yourself some latitude. There's no reason to get a non-conformance uh, because you wrote the procedure too tight. I see it a lot. Okay, um, verification of purchase product. This is incoming inspection. So as it applies, uh, this is how do I know that the stuff that I am buying meets my requirements? There are a couple of uh, specifics that you need to pay attention to if you're doing this. <coughs> Sampling. So let's say I bring in, oh, 500 PLCs. How many do I need to inspect? One? Three? None? Maybe, possibly. Uh, it depends on what you put in your procedure. If you sample, and not everything needs this, but many things do. If you are going to do a sample of some quantity that you receive, that sample has to be not nice to have, must be uh, in accordance with some acceptable sampling plan. I'm aware of two of them, the old Mill 105, which is now ASQ Z1.4, uh, and the C equals zero plan. Both of them will give you a number of units to sample. Your procedure should specify this. They make a handy dandy little slide rule that makes this really easy, but your sample uh, of what you're going to inspect needs to be based on something real. N of three, because it's past since the dark ages, is not acceptable. 
You said C equals zero, correct? C equals zero is one thing. The other is ASQ Z1.4. Z1.4. Is, is that in a relation to either one of those the military standards? Uh, 1.4 is mill standard 105E. Okay. It's just been repackaged. It's just really been packaged. Yeah, it's the same thing. I changed, as far as I know, I changed it there. Okay. It's, it's, it's the old mill 105E. Um, I've used that a lot more than I have the C equals zero. I'm much more familiar with it. It's fairly straightforward. It's fairly simple. Uh, it's easy to train, particularly if you get the handy dandy little slide rule thing. Um, if you don't have one of those and you have people doing this, look up ASQ rule online. They're 25 bucks. They're wonderful. I should get a kickback for all these things I recommended. Um, real quick story. Do an audit. How come all these stories come from Dallas based businesses? But you're in Dallas. Okay. But I don't want it much in Dallas. Um, anyway, this is a large uh, medical device company in the Metroplex. Kind of six or seven buildings, hundreds of employees. So we've done a comprehensive audit. Go out and nice. look at incoming inspection. They have two people full time that do this. So I watched this fella, and he's got a big cardboard box full of, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of some small part. I have no idea what they were. Or did I care? So he picks one of these up, puts it on his desk, takes out his old digital calipers, takes two or three measurements of it, writes it down, puts the part back in the box, puts the back box on the shelf and says approved. So no, interesting. So I have a couple of problems. N of one. So I look at the quality manager and say, well, then I watch, so N of one is a non-compliance. Worse yet, he walks back to his workstation, picks up the piece of paper that he has written these uh, dimensional uh, measurements on, wads it up and throws it away. Oh. <laughs> what? I look at the quality manager and go, I know. So if you know, why did we just do this? The, the first one is, a, you know, it is a non-compliance because they're not following any kind of sampling thing. The second one is destruction of quality data. The FDA had seen that they, they would still be there probably. That's a huge deal. So if in, as part of your incoming acceptance program, if it is important to take measurements of any type, Make sure that stuff gets documented. That's a record. It's a quality record. It, it lives per your procedure on quality records. You cannot throw them away. Uh, that's a big deal. Uh, you tip be towing close to handcuff time uh, if you do stuff like that. Uh, let's see, what else about incoming inspection? Somebody needs to make a determination on uh, is this material that we reviewed acceptable? documented. The easy way to do this is on the form itself. Here's what we received. Here's what we sampled. Here's what I inspected. Here are the acceptance criteria. Dimensionals frequently, particularly when you're dealing with hardware. There's the, there's the drawing. There's the tolerances. I measured these things that I inspect. Somebody signs off on the document and says, last inspection, okay to use. You can use a QA stamp. You can have them signed today, uh, as long as it's traceable. But we need to be able to determine who released this. So you might think about, you know, how are we doing this and make sure that uh, you do have that level of traceability. That material goes into the production process, which takes us up to our next topic. Control of my production process. Real procedures, obviously. How do you build this thing? I'm sure you have documents, so you couldn't get it done properly. Uh, you know, they follow an established procedure for assembly of you know, the products, either they or your contractor does. Um, what do we measure? What do we monitor? What kind of testing do we have? Yeah, we run the thing up and down, or um, for my limited knowledge of products like this, uh, we run a test weight on there. If it's supposed to hoist 600 pounds, we hook it up to 600 pounds, and, uh, confirm that yeah, we'll move it up and down. Do something like that, or, or a contractor perhaps. Um, so all of 
Excuse me. All of those things are designed to demonstrate that the product meets its uh, in-process test specifications. It all gets documented, all becomes part of the device, yet another acronym, uh, the device history record, DHR. The DHR, uh, think, of it, think of it as a batch record. It's the document of how the product got made, including all its test results, acceptance criteria, all that good stuff. Use of suitable equipment. Uh, it doesn't apply to you, but there are some of the real high risk devices that need not only the equipment uh, documented, but also who ran it. It doesn't apply to you, those are uh, uh, some of the active flammables. What parameters? This is where uh, the PM of this equipment may come into play. We make sure that this equipment is all uh, ready to be used, inspect, operating. Uh, use of monitoring and measuring equipment. This shows up later in Chapter 8. This stuff should be calibrated. There's a lot to this. Uh, all of this generates documentation, records for every. Now, you make your product is serialized, I would assume. So you have a, a batch size of one. Okay, piece of cake. So for every unit you make, there is documentation on how this was made, what pieces and parts went into it, any testing that may be done through the assembly process, to make sure it functions as it's supposed to, packaging, labeling, all of this goes into uh, a batch record, a uh, device history file, uh, and we'll talk about finished product release here in a minute. Questions? Is this making sense? Okay. And then it's a product. This is only required if these criteria apply. This is one that you now no doubt have uh, cleanliness requirements. You know, we don't want stuff going out the door that's, you know, and pop and spill along it, or some of these cotton candy is stuck to the top of it, or what have you. That's not what this is talking about. This is a very specific requirement, um, probably does not apply to you. This is one of those things that you would exclude. This is only required if you've been your product prior to sterilization. No. Product is supplied non sterile and is going to be clean prior to downstream sterilization. No. Tricky one is the third one. Product is supplied non sterile and cleanliness is of significance. What is of significance means is there are specifications for it. So, yeah, all product, nobody wants to put out a product that is unclean. You're going to get all kinds of complaints. The question is is, is clean, does clean have a specific definition? Are there specs on this? Microbial, perhaps, uh, or others? In your case, no. Would that be a I'm I'm confused because doesn't this apply to us because of what we do in our warehouses? Right, that's just what I was asking. Yeah, yeah, I mean the whole thing was when I went through the ride along, everything is about the cleaning process. Am I missing two something? Two different systems. So again, you're looking at a rental process. It's on a whole other standard. Yeah. Does it fall under this from an from an ISO standard standpoint. It does or does not. Does it does not. not. Does not. So this is for a new product that you're making, you're selling, and you have these requirements going out the door. From a rental standpoint, there are all other requirements that we have. There's OSHA requirements, there's shaper sure. requirements, there's other okay. two gentlemen that make sure you can attest to multiple, multiple ones. We use certain cleaning chemicals to clean all the nasty chemicals right. diseases that are out there. Total different process from, from providing a brand new product. Yeah. Okay. Exactly right. Okay. I'm just I was just confused because that's such a big part of our business. Yeah, so I was question. confused. Great question. <coughs> new product, the manufacturing process. Many products, uh, contact lenses. So contact lenses, the way those are actually manufactured, involves uh, some materials that are put on that lens material so that they can move it through the process. That stuff has to be removed for you as taking it in your eye. So cleanliness of that product is of concern. They have to have a validated process to, that assures that all of the processing agent that is used in the manufacturing process is removed prior to finished product package. It's so not your situation. There are other, you do have some other concerns, but they don't fall under this umbrella. 
and, and you're somewhere else. Okay. Um, we, we have a lot of other levels. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Um, installation. This applies to both FDA and ISO. It is relatively simple, it's, but the first question to ask is, who's responsible for when does our product require installation? Uh, if the answer to that is yes, the second question is who does it? If you do it, one of your, or someone on your behalf does it, which means you contract it out, this applies. If you sell it to the uh, buyer and the buyer installs it, this does not apply. So perhaps you have a mix. Now, the, uh, the record in the service looks almost exactly like this. The documentation requirements are fairly simple. So we want documentation showing that the product, after we or someone on our behalf installed it, functions the way we expect it to do. What does that look like? It'll be for you to determine. Your whatever testing might be, you know, to either push the button, it goes up, it goes down, uh, you know, whatever would be appropriate. That gets documented in a record, signed and dated. Installation is covered. You're golden. Very similarly, service. Now, service means a couple of different things. Somebody ships their product from their facility back to you. Wants you to fix it, and then you are going to return it to them. That's service. You send a engineer out, uh, or someone, a contractor, uh, on their behalf, goes out to someone else's facility, fixes it. That's service. Thing breaks and the do-it-yourselfer in the uh, health facility fixes it himself is not service. It's out of your control. You have no idea what they do until they call you and say, it's still, I fixed it and it's still doesn't work. Um, the documentation for this looks just like installation. After the device is serviced, whether here in the field, some district, it doesn't matter where, but uh, after the device is serviced, we, uh, whatever testing may be done, whatever process may be done to show that it functions as intended uh, is performed, signed off, yet passed, signed and dated by the person who did it, done. Uh, as easy as this is, it's messed up a lot. Uh, people got this sort of stuff and I document anything, uh, it definitely gets you written up. Actually, quite straightforward. The trick is to determine, uh, you know, what are we doing? Now, if you get material, and this doesn't even apply to you, but a lot of companies will get uh, material that might come in on a complaint, and yeah, they might rip it apart as part of the investigation. That's not service until they return it to the customer. Then it's service. But, you know, those type of products, you know, they, they might do all kinds of different things to it, but they're not going to return it to the customer. And for capital goods, you know, like stuff that you're making, yeah, it's worth a lot of money. So, you know, you might, more likely, I imagine you fix it on site. It's a shipping cost, I'm sure, not inconsequential. But yeah, that is service. Questions? On the installation, how far down are they going to take this? Is delivering to a loading dock and uncrating and removing packing material and then delivering it to a specified room, does that count as installation or does it require some type of modification or uh, attachment to a, you know, wiring or, you know, mechanical installation? Mechanical installation. So, so attachment to a floor or ceiling or... Product shows up at the customer's loading dock. One of your people, one of your engineers, or some contractor on your behalf shows up. They unpack it. They wheel it into the whatever part of the facility where it's going to be. Plug it in, and then put it through its paces per the user manual. That is installation. So that service individual says, you know, we performed the installation procedure. Everything passed. Check, 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 check. Yes, 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 pass, 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 pass. Sign date, done. Okay. Now, if, if it, I don't know why you'd send the service guy out if all they're going to do is uh, 
know, on creating the thing from the dock. If there's no installation process, then there's no installation record to sign and date. And I wouldn't think you'd send out, you know, somebody to just on create something, but that's that by itself would not be uh, considered installation. There's, I'd ask you, why is someone, you know, an expensive guy out there just to do that? But, okay, good question. Customer service. There you go. Certain customers require a little bit more attention. Now, to be on the conservative side, if I'm going to go to the effort of sending somebody there, I'm probably going to document this they plug it in correctly. <laughs> Your choice. You've got some flexibility there. Requirements for sterile devices we can skip. Uh, let's just say that they are substantial. And validation of the process. This is a great example of process validation, which I have not talked about, but we're working a good example. Is there any way to assure that the product is sterile if you know what the product itself? Uh -uh. Right. It's 100%. Is there any way to determine if the product that is supposed to be sterile is actually sterile? Yes. Yeah. It's a 100% destructive test. You can test the product for sterility. What about the stuff that they put in auto place? That's validation. If I actually wanted to test the product to determine if the product was sterile, because when I'm doing a destructive test on the product, I can't sell it. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to inspect sterility. I can't. I can validate it. And I do that in a number of ways. We, what we do actually is we validate the sterling cycle itself, and then we also monitor it with the uh, sterilization dots or if we irradiate or, or tape whatever. or whatever. Yeah. That, that is a validation method. Good question. All right, so now we're talking about process validation. This is another case where it only applies under certain circumstances. And this is one that you want to look at, particularly, we'll talk a lot more about this under auditing. But this is a focus if you're looking at uh, suppliers. Your process probably doesn't have anything that would require validation, I would guess. Uh, other processes, particularly any automated assembly, automated manufacturing, absolutely yes. So when do we have to do process validation? When resulting output cannot be verified by monitoring and what they mean by monitoring is inspection and test. So if I have an assembly process and I have a number of in-process tests that I do and I have some finished product acceptance testing that I do, my output is verified by subsequent monitoring. Therefore, process, formal process validation is not required. A client that we were hired to get them out of their uh, warning letter in impending consent decree, uh, this was an in vitro diagnostic, and he got slammed uh, for lack of process validation, but when I went on site, this was a manual process. He had folks on benches mixing stuff together in little vials and you know, making test kits. Cannot validate. There's no way to validate a manual process. It's impossible. Can't be done. I said, well, given that you can't have a process, wouldn't it be a whole lot simpler to come up with a couple of in-process and finished product tests? Oh yeah, we could do that. So, there you go. So if you have no way to know that your product meets its requirements during the manufacturing process, like sterility, this is your only other option. So any applications for that? For you well, we do it for welding because we haven't deployed that NDT. Good. Good example. Welding is a great example. So is um, uh, injection molding. You can inspect that all day long, but you can't see inside the part. You don't know if there's voids and what have. Same with welds. You can look at it externally, but it'll tell you uh, about the internal. So we validate the process. Process validation, I'm sure as you know, is a big deal. It's complex, it's expensive, uh, it's protocol driven. You're basically testing the limits of the process. Um, 
Well, it's probably not that, not that great of an example. Let's use injection molding. So I can run my injection molding process from this speed to that speed. I'm going to test both ends, and I might even test it slightly beyond that. What I'm trying to prove and document is that if I run this process at any speed between the two limits, it produces an expect product versus a narrower range where now if I'm outside it, I don't know anything. So one of the things that makes process validation difficult is determining uh, exactly what are my process limits, my process parameters, and I'm gonna test those at the extremes. Frequently, I'm also going to look at the human component. How many operators do I have? Is there even a question of shift to shift differences? Uh, do I get a different result if I run Saturday night? Um, this can really, this really get, this people make really good living. Uh, the soul on this, and no thank you. <laughs> Don't want to do that. Uh, it's very difficult. So there are some processes, welding, injection molding, some other things like that, where this is required because there is no way to inspect it to see if it needs spec. So uh, the only thing I would say if where this is applicable, get an engineer who is competent and qualified to do this. This is a difficult, expensive, and time-consuming uh, operation. All of the equipment has to be uh, calibrated, maintained, all that has to be done before you can think about starting this. Fail to do that and you have invalidated your uh, validation. Start over. Including personnel training, documented training. That's caught a number of people. Oh yeah, we got our validation. Fine, let's see the training records for the engineers. Oops, do it again. Um, this is just FYI, I just don't apply to you. This is an area that FDA is starting to pay attention to in uh, 510K submissions. Not, they've always paid attention to it at the manufacturer. Now we're starting to ask questions on, uh, from the uh, uh, suppliers. How are, how are they making this? What processes is this uh, supplier using and which, and have you determined which of those should be validated? Actually, this actually was a, uh, uh, an AI response from FDA. What processes are they using and have you determined which of those processes should be validated and are they validated? Well, when they went back to the supplier, this was a very complicated piece of uh, uh, medical device equipment. When they went back to the supplier and said, yeah, we'll be happy to do your process validation. The price just went up $250,000. So it's, it, it has a huge impact. Okay. Software validation, let's just touch on that uh, all by itself. Software validation, as I said earlier, the FDA considers firmware to be software. And we can argue all day long, uh, and I have, <laughs> it's been nowhere. Um, but it, there are formal software validation requirements. There are two guidance documents that I'm aware of. One is for uh, a software itself that is a medical device. So you ask, what would that be? Uh, the software systems that move x-rays from one place to another is one example. There's tons of them. Uh, many of them are found in radiology. But there are many others. The other is uh, the one that we would be more interested in is software contained within a medical device. Uh, if you don't already have it, that's a guidance document you should have. It's online, you can pull it down. Uh, it will walk you through the validation process for this software. Uh, it needs to be done. Uh, this would live in the uh, design file. This is not a production item so much, this is the design. Uh, and could very likely be inspected as part of the design. Show me the validation of software that runs this thing. Here you go. Uh, if you don't have it, uh, it will be a problem. Uh, like any other validation activity, validation is a snapshot. It's a point in time. It says, hey, under these conditions, at this time, with these revs of these documents, validation is successful. 
change any of that, and you need to at least consider this validation need to be repeated. Perhaps yes, perhaps no, but you have to uh, review the question and then provide some rationale, uh, particularly if you say no. Why, why you made this change? Why don't I have to revalidate? Might be a good reason for that, make sure you document it. The uh, expectation is that you are going to revalidate unless you give me uh, a good justification for why not. Make sense? Okay. Sterling, uh, this is a new section to the uh, 2016 version, and what they did was add sterile barrier systems, which don't apply to you. Uh, this is a different method for achieving a sterile product, rather than uh, nuking it in an autoclave, you manufacture it still, use a glove box or what have you. Nothing you need to worry about, fortunately. All right. Identification, coming up on 2.30 here shortly as we take a look. Identification, as product moves through the production process, the identity of the product and its status needs to be uh, somehow described. This is highly variable. In a situation like yours where you're not producing uh, a thousand units of a lot, not that hard. Everything on the floor is identified. It's all for this one unit and it's all approved. Uh, this is probably not going to be a big issue for you. Uh, it is a bigger issue for people who make you know, multiple different products uh, and there's a lot of, you know, some stuff's in quarantine, some stuff's you know, not. Uh, the product status needs to be identified. How you do that uh, can be done a number of different things, different ways. Uh, no, you don't have to have all the sign around every piece and part. Where you maintain this, uh, these items, Hope's bins, for example, uh, should be identified. Everything in the bin is approved. So approve, uh, designate status by location rather than by item. If, uh, if you do that, don't mix it though. So if you say everything in this bin is approved, don't put quarantine stuff in there or hold or, or reject. Uh, the, that is the easiest way to do it, do it by location. Uh, and yes, it's not in the regulation. Uh, good practice is have it visually identified. Uh, they will ask, you could get written up, but you need to look, look at it and go, yeah, everything here, it can be marked in tape on the floor. I see that all the time, that's okay. So you've identified everything in this area is approved. One thing to be careful of, is uh, reject. Reject is a conclusion. It is not, uh, we do not call stuff reject that we have, that we are investigating. That is hold, quarantine, whatever you want. That's stuff that's coming off, off out of the process that someone's going to evaluate and make a decision. The decision might be rework it, Maybe it's okay, it's actually okay, use it as it is, or the, uh, the third opportunity, third option would be it's rejected. <coughs> Best practice, once it's rejected, it never comes back. Zombie rejects are not a good idea. Reject says it's unusable, trash can. So be very careful about uh, identifying, identifying stuff as reject when you actually have not made that decision yet. I see people using reject <coughs> where they should be talking about quarantine. Does that make sense? So re reject is the end of the road. Uh, we don't expect to see reject product reworked. And be careful, reject should also be physically segregated from everything else. Um, this is more of an FDA thing actually than an ISO thing. FDA is now starting to be concerned uh, with intentional use of rejected product. Uh, up to this point, it's been more, you know, make, make sure that somebody can't make an honest mistake and, and pull uh, either quarantine or rejected product and, you know, get it into production because it wasn't adequately marked. Now they're starting to look more at physical security. They want to make sure that the stuff cannot be taken out of the reject cage intentionally because it's worth a bunch of money. Uh, so yeah, I'm not gonna throw that away, we're gonna sell it. 
Uh, so pay attention to that. Uh, a reject page with a padlock on it is a real good idea. If you can, it's, it's not an ironclad requirement. It's just a good way to manage this where it's applicable to what you guys are doing. Uh, returns. Last bullet point. Uh, returns are always segregated from everything else. They're going to be evaluated. There's all kinds of things that you might do with them, but uh, that's the end of the line. Make sure that they are physically segregated and then identified as quarantine, on hold, whatever you just so that they're physically segregated from good product uh, and cannot be used either inadvertently or intentionally uh, until you evaluate them and make whatever decision you make. Make sense? Comments? Questions? Disagreements? A lot of this is up to you to how do I do this? And there is no one right way. The ways to do this that the inspectors are used to seeing. Remember I said right off the bat, one of our objectives is uh, transparency. Let the FDA, let the notified body auditors see what they're used to seeing. Check the box, move on. So some of these suggestions are things that this is the way we're used to seeing it. You're doing it this way? Good. I don't have to ask 15 more questions. It's a good thing. All right. Um, just a little bit after 2 30, we need traceability, and then we can take a break. Traceability, relatively simple, particularly for you, because you serial number your product. So uh, traceability needs to be, uh, you need to be able to do this backwards and forwards. Forward traceability is fairly straightforward. As I move through the production process, uh, I'm maintaining my serial number, I know what pieces and parts go into that. Uh, a great way to audit this and test it is look at it for backward traceability. Take a finished product, that finished product has a serial number. Get into the assembly records, the device history record. I should be able to go all the way back to the BOM. Now, not every item in there is individually traceable. For example, nuts and bolts and screws do not carry lot numbers or anything else, nor do they need to. Uh, some things, like the PLCs and other major components do. Where they have individual traceability, they, that better be in, in the device history record, in the batch record. So a great way to check to see if this is working is take a finished product go backwards. Can you uh, follow that trail all the way through the production process for each of those items that carries its own ID all the way. Another way to look at this is, let's say one of your major component uh, manufacturers has a recall. How do you know, uh, and they tell you, hey, it's uh, this lot, this lot, and this lot. How do you know what, which of your products might be affected? If you can't answer that question, you have traceability issues. Okay. 2.35, 15 minutes, and then we'll wrap it up. We're three quarters of the way through.